Okay, we are live on the Edlow podcast. Hello, Eric Christensen. Hey, Josh. Great to be here. Yeah, thank you for coming on. This is a this will be a fun one for me. I love the the different groups of people that I get to speak to, and you're one of them. You are a documentary filmmaker. Well, would you call yourself a documentary filmmaker or just a filmmaker? You know, it's it's interesting that you would bring that up. I'm not crazy about the word or the description filmmaker. Okay. I find a lot of filmmakers and documentary filmmakers go into a situation with a preset idea, and then they try to squeeze that idea out of the situation. Mm. Um, and to me, I work differently. Number one, I put my subjects first, and they're healing first. I try to put them in some sort of a, literally a process towards healing, and then the film is kind of secondary. And the other thing is, you know, it's about their sacred story. So I just let them kind of roll. And then it's my responsibility to reflect the truth of their story and not necessarily what I think. Mm. And um, we can get further into that later. But, uh, you know, yeah. because I'm imprinted in the film. This is true. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I try to just take these sacred stories and reflect them because they were delivered to me in a certain way for a reason so people could connect. So there, that's a long answer for your. <laughs> no, oh, believe me, you're talking to an attorney. I can be long winded. So you got nothing on me. Don't worry about that. No, I, I actually, uh, I agree with you. You know, that's the thing that when I do the same thing with this podcast, you know, I try really hard to just ask the questions that bring out their story without putting my finger on it. You see yeah. what I'm saying? So, and then, and then ultimately let the, the person who hears it form their own opinion on the information. And it sounds like you're pretty similar in what you're doing with your documentary. I hope so. You know, and so like when it comes to a moniker and it's like, what are you? I, I'd like to say I'm a healer messenger, you know, because, oh. because it's, um, that's what my films instigate is I hope healing and, and it uh, plants a seed of hope. Yeah. Well, and that's what we're, we're here to mainly talk about is your documentary unmasking hope. Uh, which it which plays on PBS and you can stream on the PBS website. What what inspired you to do? I mean, this is this. It seems to me as uneducated in filmmaking that that was a. I mean, you have, it's a wide range of very traumatic topics. I mean, nine eleven survivors, mass shooting survivors, sexual abuse survivors, PTSD from war providers, or, or I mean survivors. What what brought this idea to light? Well, it's interesting. Hit right on it. There's a very um, diverse aggregate of different traumas in this film, and it's the really the spiritual evolution and artistic evolution of my work. And I, I've been doing these kind of films now for 32 years, which is kind of crazy to say. And it started <laughs> back, and we might go deeper into this. When I lost my home in the Pan Cave fire disaster over 32 years ago in Santa Barbara. Uh, I've always been a filmmaker since eight years old. And uh, after that fire, it just, um, I actually went to my my bottom personally, drinking and drugging. And then once I arose out of the ashes seven months after that fire, I'm like, wow, a new slate. And I think I might, I, I'm gonna do my own documentary because I've been working in the industry forever. And so I did Faces in the Fire and that, uh, you know, that came out over, 30 years ago, and it was about surviving that fire and the aftermath after, and the hope, and the healing. Yeah. And what? I got kind of addicted to that, I guess, for lack of a yeah. better word. And so three films later, here I am with Unmasking Hope, and um, I did two films just about veterans and the military trauma mm -hmm. experience. Sure. And then um, my last film had veterans of all wars and all genders. And I'm like, why don't I mix up the traumas? Because I'm finding out they're self telling the same story. Yeah. But it's totally different circumstances, but it's the same story arc. So I go, you know what? I call it my thesis. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to mix it up a lot this time. I'm going to mix it up genders. I'm going mix to mix it up, you know, ethnicity. I'm going to mix it up trauma. What was yeah. the trauma? And, and, and so uh, there's Unmasking Hope, and it came out. They're all telling basically the same story, but very different circumstances. Yeah. So before your your situation with the fire in Santa Barbara, did you 
you said you were working in the industry. Did, did you have kind of a different path before that? Oh my gosh, yeah. You know, I, I've been working. At, well, my, I made my first film with a script when I was eight years old. And if you've okay. seen, the, if you've seen the Fablemans, it was like kind of my story, like okay. having the film and having the editor in my room and my dad telling me that maybe I should like think about doing a real job. You know, <laughs> true. And, uh, but you know, so I've been doing it for a long that for a long time. But then I went to California Institute of the Arts. I worked professionally starting at 13 in on the sets. And then I went to California Institute of the Arts in the 80s, had my mind expanded in various ways. And one of them was working with different um, different disciplines. I, I worked with dance, I worked with theater, I worked with, you know, fine artists. And so that just, you know, really opened me up. And then um, I started working in the industry, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. consistently as an editor. And I did music videos, I did commercials. And my work before the fire was very flashy. It was all about, you know, getting people's attention. You know, it's it was at the beginning of the whole um, California rap, West Coast rap. I, oh, yeah. I ended up being like a editor for a, a director named Marty Thomas. And I worked with MC Ren, Above the Law. I worked with um, wow, that's going uh, back. Ice Cube, all these crazy like things yeah. as an editor. Yeah, and so it was very different before the fire than after the fire. God kind of got a hold of me, and He gave me this calling, and so that was all kind of in the rearview mirror. At one point, I even had to call up Marty, and when he kept going, "Hey, man, I want you to edit my new movie or my new rap video," my rap, I'm like, you know. I'm on such a different path. I, I, I can't do that anymore. Yeah. You know? isn't, isn't that interesting? You know, it's funny. We, and it's so hard when you're in the middle of trauma to like, to think about this. Right. But I think about my own traumatic events in my life. Um, and I always come out later looking back and going almost, I mean, maybe not, I'm glad that happened, but being like, wow, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be in the path that I am now. And I like the path I'm on now. And it's, it's interesting how you, you know, to some people hearing what you were doing beforehand, that just sounds awesome. Like you're working with, you know, you're working with all the, 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 the who's who's of gangster rap and you're dealing with, you know, all of, all of the West coast rap scene and, and you're, you're really making it. And then boom, this traumatic event happens and you go down a path that doesn't seem as flashy and traditional, but is fulfilling for you. It's, you know, I, I, I forgot to mention, you know, my, what my college job was. I, I worked for Diamond Dave Lee Roth in college. That Did was, you really? Oh, yeah. And so, so anyways, this is a whole different sidelight. But, you know, in, in California Institute of the Arts, we have editing suites and all the editing time is very valuable in the in the suites. And I, I would get like mementos off the different sets of the David Lee Roth videos when he was doing his solo stuff. Uh, for example, I had the wetsuit from California Girls and I would trade it for editing time. Really? <laughs> but wow. but yeah, it, it's funny how God does this thing. I, I'm a spiritual man and I and I you know I, I freely say that and um, it, it just a friend of mine once told me that uh, pain is the touchstone of growth. Mm. And I hate that. <laughs> uh, me too. <laughs> me too. So, you know, sometimes you sit there and I agree. I agree. That's true. You know, if you think of it, you know, spirituality versus physical, right? I'm a big gym guy. I go to the gym six days a week. The only way you get bigger, the only way you get healthier is by putting yourself under pressure and putting yourself to the point of pain. And I think spiritually, it's the same way. God sometimes gives you these incredibly painful um, experiences to help you grow and help you become stronger and be the person that ultimately you're supposed to be, maybe for yourself or maybe for someone else. I got to think that you, you know, the work you're doing now, you're probably helping a lot more people than you were working for David Lee Roth or ice cube or not that that's a bad thing or it's not fun but it's you're probably helping helping people more. you know there's a strange dichotomy in in entertainment and i think once you get really wrapped up in and i'm i'm kind of an old hippie you know I, this mm -hmm. morning i was just alone on the beach with my dog for two hours and doing <laughs> my thing and i'm clean and sober I, I don't partake in that part of the hippie experience but right i think kind of differently and I think there's this strange dichotomy in the industry when you get wrapped up into the whole money thing and money thing kind of money always makes, I don't know. Yeah. It's not my main goal. It's helpful to have, yeah. 
Yeah. But, um, but th- when you wrap up in that whole man- money thing and, and you're like, well, at least we're, we're supplying entertainment. That's what I'm giving people. So, you know, okay. There's some, there's some, uh, truth to that. Yeah. I, I think people are supplying, but you know, you're also getting multi-million dollars and stuff, but, but the thing is, you know, with what I, what, what I, what I do, it's, it's, it's on so many sides of the camera. I see the people in my films heal. I mean, in, in my last film, I, I went to Las Vegas, which I despise Las Vegas, but I went to Las Vegas to take the Route 91 shooting survivors back to Vegas to go to the Memorial Garden. Right. And to be able to be honored to accompany them there. And oh, by the way, we had the camera, so it's in the film. Number one mission was to get them back there so it would, it would, make the help their healing progress so that kind of pay is very different i think there's it's god's economy kind of stuff you know i think there's two economies we live in the world's economy where we have to you know have that dollar bill and it's and it's based on a lot of greed it's based on a lot of just all sorts of things and there's god's economy which you know works on us giving away it's service it's love it's it's just um unselfishness and um so it's it's that it's that dichotomy that you know um, in the industry and uh, and there are great things coming out and it does help. I, I man, I, I uh, been a consumer of entertainment. Thank God for you know uh, things like uh, just my favorite films. You know and yeah. and then and you know, but it's interesting um, interesting cross section there that we're discussing. Yeah, well. Let me tell you, you know, it's something you said there about money. You know, I, I can tell you, you know, I'm, a, I'm an attorney and, you know, I do I do well, I very well financially. I've, I've been very blessed. I've uh, I've been blessed lo- farther along. I mean, I, I, I always I always knew in my head that I was going to do well, but I but I didn't realize I was going to do as well as fast as I did. And the thing that was so interesting about it to me, what I found fascinating, I grew up in a home where my parents were both, um, uh, neither one of them graduated college. They're great people. My dad was a, is a recovering, as a recovered drug addict. He was a drug addict and, and got clean and sober. Uh, I don't even know how many years ago, it was over 25. And, uh, so growing up in that was real rough, but, um, but in my household, when there was conflict, the conflict always had to do with drugs and money. And, mm-hmm. and, and I, uh, so I, in my head coming out, I just thought, okay, if I don't do drugs and I make all the money, everything's going to be fine. Right. And what I've learned now is when you're chasing that money, cause I did for a long time, like I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, you know what, if I just paid off this student loan, then I'll be okay. And then it was okay. If I just have the big house, it'll be okay. If I just have the nice car, it'd be okay. And then it got to the point where it's like, if I built a movie theater in my house, it'll be okay. If I <laughs> if I had a pinball machine, then I'd be happy, right? And uh, and I got all those things, and they're fun, but they don't provide the lasting happiness. And and I try to instill that in my kids who live in a different world than I do, and I'm trying to or than I did as I was growing up, and I just go, listen, guys, like this, I'm telling you. You, it is more important to you, for you. You have to live within your means, whatever those are. But I'm telling you, I've been lucky to find something that, that I do find fulfilling. But if you don't find something fulfilling and you're just doing it for money, that is not a great way to live. You got to find something that, that fills your soul, and makes your heart sing, whatever that is, you know? And it sounds like you found that. You know, that's, you know, talking about the kids and stuff, it's just, you know, I have three amazing kids and they've, they've all grown up fairly adapted, I can say. That's what I like to say. And, um, but, you know, with them, with them growing up, that one thing, you know, it's just, it, it said, whatever, you know, we would say, whatever you're passionate about, we will support, but you have to prove your commitment to the passion and then we will support it, you know? And uh, that's good. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, my oldest boy, uh, he got married, um, several months ago and now I'm going to be a grandfather, which is real exciting. That's oh, his that's path. Awesome. My, my middle boy played football at Harvard and now he's working for JP Morgan. And the funny thing about that though, is it's this, this whole money thing. Yeah. I'm like, Will, you got to just, you know, maybe take a couple of years off and go surf around the world, go chill, just 
he went right from that boiler of that school into, and I, I watch him and I'm like, I'm very, very concerned about him. And then there's my, my wonderful daughter and um, she's taken in a different direction and she's a plus size model in New York and she's very active in the LGBTQ community. And just, uh, she, she's my little, she's my little uh, doppelganger, I guess. Or whatever. And, and it's just, um, but it's just, it's just like, what are you going to chase? And, but, you know, since we're just rapping, I, I, I got to admit, though, I'm thinking about, I'm on, on the beach today, I'm thinking about, like, things, and I'm like, okay, big weekend for the film, because it's airing six, over 600 times, like, in three days, and I'm like, okay, that's pretty exciting, you know, and I got to tell you, there's a not, not whole, whole lot of uh, economic um, re- uh, compensation on the back end in public television, and um. And I'm, I'm like, okay, like, so a lot of people are going to say it, but I, I, I kind of, I think the human thing goes to where's mine? Yeah. You know, I'm like, but I got to go, okay, wait, alternate universe. You're in God's world. Like, put myself yeah. in God's world. Oh, okay. That's yeah. a lot of souls touched. I'm like, okay, so that's, um, that's going, maybe that might be going in the bank somewhere, you know? Yeah. And it's that duality that we deal with, like you were talking about, you know, it's like yeah. money, spiritual life health, fitness, all that stuff coming up. And um, yeah, gosh, it's balance, isn't it? It is. It is. You know, it's funny. I heard a quote not too long ago and I love it. And I've shared it a couple of times now. And it's a, uh, it's a society grows, uh, grows best when men plant trees, the shade of which they're never going to, uh, uh, they're never going to sit in. Oh and, my gosh. Yeah. And, and I think that like the, you know, you doing this documentary, it's going to show 600 times there's probably going to be at least a few, if not more, who are in a spot where they need to see it, you know? And because your your film is so interesting because, yeah, like I, I watched I watched some of it. I, I haven't finished it, but I've watched some of it. And it was specifically the ones that really touched me were the 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 9-11 survivor was a big one. But the 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 child sexual abuse survivor, mm. and and you could tell um, when he when he starts talking about I couldn't I couldn't tell my mom, you know, and uh, you know there's a scene where he talks about he couldn't tell my mom, and so I just said it was boring over at this uh, uh, you know this this tutor's house, and then says so I but I just kept going back, for him, that was a three year nightmare. And there's someone out there, you know, unless you're in that situation, this is what's so interesting I found about trauma. Mm -hmm. Unless you're in it, people say things like, this is a deal breaker for me, or this would never happen to me. I would never let this happen. Well, I'm telling you, you don't know until you're there how you're going to react. And so when some, you know, there might be someone else out there, I'm thinking about that right now, who is like, why did I keep going back? Why did I keep going back? And hearing that someone else kept going back for three years is going to help them realize they're not alone and there's nothing wrong with them, you know? Um, oh and, yes. And and so, and that, I mean, like you said, like there, there's a spiritual pay to what you do that is, I think, probably more important than money. Although maybe on the next one, you'll get better on the back end. <laughs> you know, I keep thinking that, but I'm, I'm, I, you know, I've turned 60 and this is my fourth film. And I'm like, okay. But here's the funny thing is, you know, thank God my wife has built an incredible real estate business. And that's, you know, when I moved, when I moved out of that kind of fast paced kind of thing for a while, I did become the king of toothpaste. Uh, I did all these toothpaste commercials and I took Rembrandt (laughs) for six years until they sold. Then after that, my, my career kind of dropped off and my wife picked up real estate. And then I, I focused more on my docs, which don't make a lot of money. So I kind of have this day job thing, you know, and um, and I went to a real estate convention in all places, uh, or it's actually it was a deep dive seminar um, in in Vegas just recently, and um, everybody's there on conventions, you know, and I see mm-hmm. these guys, and I, I try not to judge. I mean, that's like, but it's, it, I see all these guys with their little badges and everything, and they're like working for these huge corporations, and you know, I think it was a God whisper is. I thought, I'm like, you know, I have four films. And I'm saying this out loud because it helps me. 
I have four films. That's a little bit of a legacy. And the people that have seen it, and I do have the stories of people that have been changed. Yeah. I'm like, gosh, I have I have that to hang on to, you know? And that's, uh, you know, it's like my a good mentor friend of mine said, you know, when, when, when you pass away, the hearse doesn't have like a U-Haul trailer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so... You know, and also Ralph Waldo Emerson, who I love, who is a, was a Harvard uh, graduate, um, you know, he, he said it's like, it, it's not so much of what, how much you made or what you've taken, it's what you've given back, yeah. you know? And so, yeah. you know, it, it's just funny because I, I just, I hear myself and I'm like, Eric, you're just making a lot of like justification for not having like a... <laughs> But but the thing is though is that you're you're right like you're right and and I got to tell you as someone this is this may sound a little weird I just got through talking about how grateful I am for my job and all these things that I did but like people someone like you I actually have a lot of respect for and I wish I could be more like you and what I mean by that is is that there are lots of things like this this podcast is one of them i've thought about doing this for a long time and i just never did because i'm like how am i going to find the time i've got you know i work 60 hours a week i've got four kids i've got you know all these other things i was big into pro wrestling for a long time i put that on the back burner i just started doing that you know and and i i i find it's so courageous that like you had a job i'm assuming that the stuff you were doing before the fire you were doing well, you were having a good career, you were making oh, yeah. a lot of money, but you weren't necessarily fulfilled. And yeah. you and you gave that up to, to do something that fulfills you. And maybe you're not making as much money. Maybe you're not, you know, you don't have the typical day job that other people have. And, and maybe somebody, someone out there, you know, makes you feel bad for that. But I, I personally find that to be one of the most courageous things to chase something that is meaningful to you over doing what everyone else does. I saw a scene, I saw a, a, a reel on TikTok because I spend way too much time looking at that stuff. Yeah. And, and, and it was this, it was a scene from a movie where I think it's George Clooney saying to, to a guy, he goes, uh, you know, I see you were a, you know, you, you majored in French culinary uh, here you're working here. How much did they? How much did they pay you to give up your dreams? And he's like thirty thousand dollars a year, <laughs> you know. And it's just that's true, you know. How many people want to be a rock star? Want to be a musician? Want to be an actor? Want to be a, a documentary filmmaker? And give it up because, you know, that's the responsible thing to do. Well, I super appreciate that. I need to hear that today. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad. See, that was you know, where God put me in your path today. Yeah. Yeah, and you know the interesting thing. You know, it, it's just, you know, you read Facebook or you get these like memes that are like follow your dreams and da 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 and all this great stuff. And it's real easy to like, oh, gosh, you know, I, I would love to do that, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, when you're actually in, <clears throat> you know, when you when it's boots on the ground and you're in that position, you know, I, I don't know how many times, you know, that I'm like, I, I had a question why, but you know, that's four films. I, it's part of the process now. Why am I here? Why am I doing this for this? At the end, I got to be honest, at the end of all my films, and my wife knows this, in the in the last year when I'm in post-production, I don't get, I never pay myself because all that money goes back into the film because I want it in the film, you know? Sure. And so, uh, but the other, here's, here's the other side of that. And I want to say to the, everybody that's listening is every time, this is a this is a tricky part, and I'll I'll make a strange analogy. Is every time I commit to something, but I mean commit with all of my heart. When I I, I was a skateboarder for a long time, I quit actually skateboarding pools and things when I was like in my late forties. So I skated mm-hmm. for a long time, uh-huh. and so when you would drop in in a pool on your skateboard, and you're dropping in on the vertical off the coping into the pool. The more you commit to something that seems very insane, I'm jumping into this pool with no water. Um, the more you commit, the more likely you're going to land it and, and you're going to have a good run. But if you hesitate at all, you're going to eat it and it's going to hurt really hard because you're jumping into an empty pool. Does that make sense? It totally so, does. So with my films, I, and, and this is where I want to end up with this, in this analogy, with my films, the more I committed 
to the film in my heart of hearts, the more God would provide on, in other ways, because our business has been very successful, even when, you know, I wasn't there to help my wife, et cetera, et cetera. In the last year of this film, the more I committed to just getting this thing done and getting it out there, going to that, not, not the best business sense. I'm like, okay, all the money that it's going to go back into the film because I want it to be professionally colored. I wanted to do this. I want to use the best composer that I have. Sure. You know, and, um, so that money just goes back into that. But the more I commit to it, then on the other side, we were taken care of. Yeah. You know, and, and you can't, you can't manipulate that. That's the weird thing. You can't go, I'm going to go do this and maybe this will happen. It this doesn't work that it's something very metaphysical. It's something very, and I can't explain it, but you know, um, it, it happens every time. Yeah. You know? and I, I think I, it, go ahead. I was talking to my aunt recently about some stuff going on in my own life and, and, uh, and she she put the best analogy and she goes you know a lot of the times god needs you to take a, a a leap of faith into the darkness and when you do you're going to find out that as you're falling you're going to land on a feather bed oh <laughs> and i was like that's a that's a great way to describe it because you're right like think about how much stuff you had to do and how many things that you've done that required a lot of faith not knowing where it was going to go and now, and it worked out just the way it was supposed to. I mean, this film was great. Like what I've seen of it, I'm like, this is, this documentary, it keeps your interest. You know, I mean, it's something that really it's, it, it's, it's, it does provide a, a bit of, of healing um, to hear the stories of these people who've gone through things that are just way more traumatic than anything I've ever gone through. You know, um, why, why trauma? Like what, what is it about trauma that you find so interesting? You know, it, it's something I understand, you know, and it's it's interesting because, because people go, oh, you understand because you lost your home in the fire. No, that was that was like that was just the tip of the iceberg. It's a trauma that I put myself through. Hmm. It's a trauma that I induced in myself by the drinking and drugging. It's just yeah. and getting so lost and so spiritually depleted by that process. Yeah. And so I understand the steps back to recovery. And one thing I really understand, you know, with, and it's, this is not braggadocia, it's, I have 32 years of recovery. I still go to two meetings a week in my group, you know, and I sponsor other guys. But here's, here's the one thing I do understand because of this, it doesn't go away, but it yeah. becomes part of your narrative. It becomes part of your life. And it becomes part of the assets that you have so you can help other people. Yeah. You know, I try to help other other recovering addicts and alcoholics. I do help. I, I just I work with yeah. quite a few guys that <clears throat> and that's just the way it works. But that's one yeah. thing I think that is a thread between all recovery is, you know, and, and it's just and it, it just doesn't work that you can go into rehab for 90 days and switch your whole life and that broken part of you and all of a sudden be like, oh, I'm done with this stuff now. Hey, right. my hats are off to you. If you can actually go do that and 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 then leave, live a clean and sober life after that, that's not my story. Yeah. My story is an ongoing thing. And it's the same with, you know, trauma. These 9-11 survivors that you mentioned over 20 years later, still struggling, you know, and and so the key is, as Dr. Amit Ekin of Stanford University and also neuroscience says in my film, mm -hmm. it's incorporating it into your personal story, your narrative. Mm -hmm. And then that way you have a little bit more control over that, over it. You know, you can, it's part of your story. And, and then part of my story and part of what I reflect in my films is then that can be used for other people that are going through the same thing you went through. Yeah, you know, it's so funny you brought up Dr. Etkin because I remember Dr. Etkin in, your, in there said something along the lines of like, when trauma happens, it's shocking to you and it creates a break in your life narrative. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is exactly what happens. And and if you don't take care of it, it grows and it festers. I remember telling my my mom one time, there was a there's traumatic events that, that have brought up a lot of stuff for me in the in the you know in the recent past. But I remember telling my mom like 10 years ago, she was said, said something along the lines, you know, have you ever thought about like going to therapy or something because of all the stuff that happened when you were a kid? 
And I was like, hey, I spent a lot of time and a lot of a lot of Reese's peanut butter cups and things like that that to, <laughs> to shove all that stuff down. I don't need somebody coming and dragging all that stuff up. But what I find so interesting is then when some other traumatic event happens, it it will come up. You know what I mean? It it, it can't be buried forever. And so, oh my gosh. Yep. you know, it's interesting how, how that works. And now, so tell me, do you think, it sounds like what you're saying is, is your trauma, even though, you know, it sounds like what you're saying is your trauma, a lot of it was self-inflicted, informs you in making these, uh, these documentaries and kind of makes it a little bit better for you. Does that sound right? It's because I can empathize and yeah. I can't say that more than enough. Empathy, empathy, empathy. I think there's a lack of empathy in today's society. And empathy is not just sympathy. Oh gosh, I feel sorry for you. Empathy takes an action. And empathy mm -hmm. is like putting really putting yourself and projecting yourself into somebody else's situation and their emotions. So it, it it's and when it's done face to face, when you're connecting with somebody, it's it's it makes you vulnerable mm. because then you're really connecting and you're putting yourself and it's kind of dangerous because we have these society norms, you know, and, and let me go there. Say it's a, it's, it's a trans person, right? Mm -hmm. Cause I do have this in my life mm -hmm. and, uh, and you're like, well, I don't understand that whole thing, but you see them face to face and you see how they interact with somebody that, you know, or whatever. Then it also, it, then you start to like, Oh, then you start to see their ostracism and then you start to like connect. I was ostracized because I wasn't a jock. I was ostracized. And then you start going, oh my gosh, and I kind of understand them. And then you see, and you see face to face, they're as human as you. Yeah. You know, it's my friend Spencer Barnett's who wrote the title song, the ending song credits. He said in one of his songs, all we want is, is love and something good to eat. And you're like, oh my God, that person, all they want is love and something good to eat. And all of a sudden, you've broken these barriers down. You've made yourself vulnerable, and you connected. But society's norms, and that meme that you just read on your right-wing site, not that I'm right or left, says, you know, all this trans stuff is really terrible. You know? Um, but So I'm going against what somebody told me is wrong. I'm starting to feel for this person. You know? So <clears throat> I, I you know, it's a tangent there, but it just... No. It's, no, that's a, it's, it's empathy. Yeah. And that's an important point. You know, I, I, I mentioned this on other podcasts. I did a podcast with a, a young man named Sonny Smith and he, uh, it was a long podcast and I felt like it was the most informative podcast for me on being transgender. He, I call him he because he identifies as a man now, but he, uh, he was a born biological man, has gender dysphoria. And I went, I go to church with them. I'm Mormon, right? And the Mormon community that there's a little, not a lot, but I mean, there's, well, yeah, there's some tension there between the LGBT community and the, and the Mormon community. And, uh, I, I knew this guy since he was 12 years old. I was his, I was the president of the men's group when he left on his mission and came back on, from his mission. And, uh, I had no idea. And then all of a sudden I, he, he starts transitioning and then transitions back. And I had him on the podcast and we went through his whole story and the interactions he had within the church and outside of the church and all these different things. And he had some other mental health issues too. But I, I remember walking away from there and going like, I never knew. And had I knew, I probably would have taught some of those lessons a little differently. I probably would have tried it a little differently. And I said, and then I remember thinking to myself, why did I have to know to, to, to do it differently? This is a person who is going to, who's having a human experience that I'm never going to have. And, and why do I have to know that he's having that to show empathy for them? Why do they have to, why do I have to know they're in the room? to have the empathy and it kind of changed. It was, it was, I don't know if I would say it's life changing, but it definitely changed my views a lot on, on those types of issues because that's really what tra I think this trauma thing is all about and everything. And why I do this podcast is because we are all just humans having a very real experience, yeah. you know? And, and, and so, yeah, I mean, you, you said you have some experience with the trans community. Is that, is that right? And so, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it just, one of, the, one of the most amazing quotes I've seen lately, well, 
there's so many of them. It's, you know, a, a sign of maturity is being able to understand and love somebody without necessarily agreeing with them. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, I learned that. I don't have to compromise necessarily my beliefs to love somebody. Yeah. No, that's true. Which is a big deal in today's society right now, because if, if everybody understood that, I think I think this whole divisiveness and this whole tension would kind of slide away. I can love you, but I don't have to dis. I, I don't have to agree. Yeah, you know, yeah. and um, gosh, it's just that's and that's and that's hard. hard. That's actually hard on both sides right now. Of this of these issues, you know. I mean, um, it's rough, and I and I don't know how we get back there other than just trying to be the change ourselves. Um, Tell me, of all the people that you saw, you know, and you, you interviewed, you worked with on this film, was there one that you found um, kind of had an effect on you more than any other or a situation? You know, I love analogies. I was just talking to my sister the other day, and uh, I'll bring it back to your question. <laughs> sure. 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 We're talking about, she goes, I love crunchy foods, and we're eating uh. potato chips. I go, I think crunchy foods are one of my favorites. And then I look over and I'm like, well, there's pudding. I love pudding and it's not crunchy. Yeah. So the thing, but the point is with, with the people in my film, I, I fall in love with each one. And then the next thing I think about is somebody else. You know, I'm like, oh my God, because it's just, it, it, they're so different. But, you know, I, and I don't want to single anybody out. I mean, because Becky, the artist, the 9-11 survivor, is just absolutely a beautiful soul, you know, and her work. Becky Lazinger, you know, look her up on Instagram and look at her work and her paintings. Give her a shout out because she needs it because she does amazing work and she keeps painting no matter what. That's her thing. After 9-11, she found herself in her painting again. You know, and it, it's her healing. And it's just how awesome to, like, be able to sit in her studio and look at all her work. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. I mean, but then all of a sudden I jump over to Lyman, who's the African-American gentleman that was sexually molested when he was eight years old. And it's just like he was groomed the whole situation, and he was just stuck. But his, man, I have respect for him because he came out and he told his story, and now he affects hundreds and I mean, if not thousands of young men in a particularly difficult demographic, because it's not easy to say that as a man, much less than a, much less an African American man in in yeah. society. One in six men are sexually molested, and it's just and 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 I gotta say to anybody listening, if you're if this is like activating you, if you're like, oh my gosh, now I'm starting to think my uncle, or my or whatever. Go to a website called oneinsix.org, oneinsix.org, and they have a ton of materials, other people telling their stories, and it can be the start of the journey for you. But going back to, I fall in love with each one. Of course, Molly, the the she, the Route 91 survivor, and then she's like, okay, what's the odd of you know the odds of being in a mass shooting like that after being in Route 91, and she comes home and. She finally kind of gets her stuff together. She goes, I think I'm going to go out and do some line dancing. And she goes to the borderline. And guess what happens at the borderline? She's Man. in another mass shooting. Man. And so what does that do to your sense of safety? It completely breaks your sense of safety. She has a young daughter. You know, how is she going to even go out to the supermarket? Because I have a hard time. I was just in Vegas, and I'm like, there's no metal detectors here. Yeah. There's nothing here. And I was like paranoid. But can you imagine being through two and like just going to the supermarket? And but she found an organization, which is our partner organization, outreach organization called Give an Hour and giveanhour.org. And they offered free counseling. And she got into counseling. And now she's a peer counselor for them and, wor and works for them now. And her healing is amazing. So, man, each one. I absolutely love. I could go through them all, but it might take the rest of the show. Yeah. So if I miss any of you guys, Jack, yeah. Sandra, all you guys, I love you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that and that's what's so great. You know, when you have genuine love for the people that each shows in your work, and I can tell you, you know, that's funny. Um, you go back to the societal norms, and you were talking about, you know, being a being a man who was who was uh, traumatized. 
you know, yeah, that's that's a hard thing, especially mm-hmm. when, um, you know, you you have this, uh, you know, the Me Too movement, but there's no real Me Too for the guys, you know, um, and uh, not that that's a bad thing, you know what I mean? Not that the Me Too movement's a bad thing. I mean that you know that that needed to happen for sure. But what do you do when you're a guy and you're supposed to be this macho man and all these things and something like that happens to you or even any trauma, any abuse that happens to you, whether it's physical, emotional, sexual. And, and, you know, um, it's hard for people to grasp. It's hard for people to grasp that that happens. I mean, like I said, you know, I'm sure just talking about him, there's a lot of people who would say you kept going back for three years. Why did you do that? Was there anything, I, like I said, I didn't watch the whole thing, but did, did anyone describe why why someone might go back in that type of situation? You know, not necessarily in the film, but it just, you know, and particularly with the molestation type of thing, it, it just, I mean, I could do a whole film. And again, one in six.org really explains this, is you do get caught in a very dark cycle because... It's normally the perpetrator is somebody that you trust and somebody that you built a they they a, a big bond with. Sure. And somebody that you actually, you know, you love. And so, you know, to to all of a sudden break that off, you know, and that's that's again, it becomes a question of empathy because for the outsider it's like that's insane why are they doing that but you have to take the moment of being vulnerable and trying to put yourself in such a a position of that and see that there are so many to the individual there are so many risks to breaking off that that relationship that they're depending on it and so the pain of it at the time doesn't necessarily outweigh what they might actually be getting out of it, at least at that moment. And so it's, mm. it's just, yeah, man, it's, it's a tough thing. It's just, it is, uh, it is a tough thing. And do you, um, you know, as you're going through this process and you're watching the healing, tell me kind of, is there a, um, is there kind of a, a pattern of healing that you see through these traumas that a step-by-step process, or is everybody kind of different? Everybody is different, but I can really break it down into a very simple kind of pattern, you know, mm-hmm. is, you know, the, the trauma happens and, and you come home. I, I'm using maybe the example of a veteran, maybe any trauma, but I would always say come home because I'm always talking about the veteran. So you go through, anyways, you go through a trauma, then you kind of re-enter back into your normal life and you're like, something is wrong. I'm having these outbursts of anger. I'm having this disconnection with people. I don't, I don't like doing things I used to like to do. I don't connect with, I mean, something is wrong. And it's just like, and, and, and you buried what happened most, most often. And, um, and then something might trigger it. It could be my film could be anything. And you're like, Oh man, there, I see it was, and that's you know there's a very there's a very big argument and and the, I mean it's true these child childhood traumas that we buried and here we are like 50 60 years old uncovering them th- this happens and you're like oh my gosh that's what it is that's what it was and then you start to discover and then you start to do a little bit of research or or you accidentally God put somebody in your path and like Lyman Lyman had that one fellow that was molested by the same guy. And he connected with them and he goes, oh, my gosh, you too. That is, that's one of the biggest words, two words in, in recovery, you too. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're not alone. And then you start talking and those things like going back, they went back. Oh, my gosh, I'm not insane. I thought I was just the only one experiencing this because we all know we get isolated with the pandemic too and everything. Crazy. We get so isolated. So you're, I'm not the only one. And you're, 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 you did that too. And then sin, you're like, oh my gosh. And you're making this connection. And that connection is, is, is huge that you're not alone anymore. Yeah. And then, then it's like the next step usually is that we've identified this. You're not alone. And then hopefully that other person might be a little bit ahead of you on the healing, you know, on the healing climb or whatever you want to call it journey. Mm-hmm. And, uh, 
then you start to maybe ape some of the things they're doing, it's copying. When we, oh, you're going to this group? I'll go to this group. Then the next thing you know, you're involved in this group. And the next thing, and then all of a sudden, you're like rebuilding your narrative. That narrative that was broken, you're starting to rebuild that. And, and you're like realizing this did happen to you. Truth is a big part of this. There's a book that uh, and a Harvard professor once said, you know, until you can face the raw truth of what happened, there's going to be no healing. And that's why going to memorials are so important. Going back to uh, the Route 91 shooting, uh, it's a memorial garden in Las Vegas. That's what it's called. But it has, it has 58 different stations of all the people that were lost there. And going back there for the Route 91 survivors is a confirmation and a validation that this did happen. Mm. And then being able to be there and get through that and go back to the place where it happened proves to you that you can do hard things. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of validates that, wow, this did happen. I can go back and I kind of have a little bit of control. It doesn't control me as much as I thought. Being like back over here and not going back to the memorial you don't have any control over it anymore. It's like out there in Las Vegas spinning like crazy. Mm. And so you mm. get there and you get a little control. And what we did is we painted these rocks. It's a it's a it's a uh, pilgrimage basically. You find a rock and paint it and take it to the memorial. And that's part of the healing. You leave a little bit of yourself there in that rock. And then you go back home and you know your rock is back there and you place it very carefully where it's get like this because it was very uh it was very uh, emotional to go back with molly and heidi and and see where they decided to place their rocks yeah but so you get the idea and then your life continues on and then here's the final part of this whole process is you'll you'll meet somebody that's going through it early again in the early stages and you can help them and then that's where I see this like curve of healing that's going like this, jet straight up almost. Mm -hmm. When you start to help other people, it just because then it validates your experience wasn't for nothing. Your experience has meaning because now you can help somebody else. Yeah. So there you go. And that so what would you say to somebody, you know, who maybe not someone who's watched watching your film, but you obviously have a lot of thoughts and you've, you've done a lot of study. You're an expert on this now. What would you say to somebody who is in the early stages of trauma and is kind of in that spot where they don't know what to do? What would be your recommendation? You know, is gosh, it's, that's a tough place. Don't isolate. Now, what does that look like? <laughs> I can't actually say. What, what are the resources around you and how far are you willing to go? Are you willing to reach all the way out to the rape center and say, hey, this happened to me? Or are you kind of like, I'm not too sure. Maybe I know somebody that and then I can talk to them. Is that how far you're going to expand your circle? Look at that and, and see. But don't isolate and don't hold it in anymore. It's so important. That, and, and you know what? Here's, here's a spiritual law for me. Action begets action. You take that one action when you're sitting there. And you're isolated. You could be in a million people. You could have a thousand people around you and still be isolated. But you take that one action towards like healing and towards like reaching out to somebody. For me, I believe God will like take that action and multiply it. And then you'll also be like, wow, isn't that a weird co coincidence? I reached out to you. Then three people called me the next day. You know, stuff like that. It, it, it just happens. Yeah. It just happens. Action begets action. So take that first action and don't isolate. Isolation in any sort of mental health situation is a complete killer. Yeah, I got to imagine that's true, man. So um, with this with this uh, this show, uh, when did it first air? Um, let's see. S sometime mid January, I believe. January 17th, 19th, around there. No, we had the premiere on the 19th and it begin airing the January 23rd of this year. Wow. Okay. And now you're, I mean, you're having 600 airings over this next weekend. What, what is it specifically about this weekend? Is there something specific or are they just, you know, like, oh, it, it is, there is something specific as a, a, a organization called world channel 
picked it up and they're out of WGBH Boston. And here's an interesting little story is when I was a kid, I used to watch Nova and I don't if, know if you ever remember that. I was a geek and I love science. <laughs> And WGBH produced Nova, and Nova went all over the world with in search of science. And as a kid, I said, man, wouldn't that be cool to be on WGBH? Because they are like, they may not be the biggest, but they are the crown jewel in classiness. Right. And so WGBH has this org like uh, coalition of public television channels <laughs> called World Channel. And they choose the best of the best programming, and they chose our film. And it was this weekend that they decided to have their premiere and launch it to their like a uh, chain of, uh, of public television stations. And so uh, we've just been blessed with a, a huge pickup on it. And, and it's interesting how public TV is now. I don't want to get too technical, but you know, there's not just like one main channel for every town, you know, it's like, uh, let's just say, for example, Washington, W E uh, W E T A. Uh, the Washington's public channel, they have several sidebands, you know, and uh, digital channels, and they reach all sorts of different audiences. So in each each big, you know, area like Washington, D.C., like uh, Boston, WGBH, which is such an honor, and if anybody from them is hearing, thank you, um, the, the, all their side channels have picked it up, too. So it's like we got a prime time showing, we have a morning showing, we have all this craziness all over the place, and I had to just look at it twice. I'm like 600 Earrings, yeah. but uh, yeah, but yeah, we're yeah. on a three year cycle with our uh, distributor, uh, Nita, and they've been amazing in getting the film out. My publicist, Ariel Carpenter, and our uh, public relations, uh, our, our station relations person, Nimi Singh, has done a great job. And and now it's it's at you know, it's up to God to like keep propagating this thing. So, so tell me, like, after that three-year cycle, do you take it elsewhere, or do you you keep it? How, what what goes next with the film? You know, it's it's interesting because I, I don't want to say there's there's not a huge market for my kind of films. After you know, it, it just uh, it's interesting. It, it, when I went to California and see the arts, one of my teachers said, you know, he goes, "Keep doing what you do." And don't worry about the flavor of the day because one day you'll be the flavor of the day. And maybe, maybe this is, maybe this weekend is I am the flavor of the day or whatever, but I just keep doing what I do. And um, after that three years, no, there, it just, I, I'll probably read, well, if Nita's listening, I'm, I'm tipping my hat to them, I'll, I'll probably renew. The interesting thing is Searching for Home, Coming Back from War, my last film, which you can find on, um, uh, <coughs> Uh, streaming. I'm not sure what streaming platforms it's in. We released it slightly different. We weren't on the PBS stream. But anyways, you can find uh, uh, Searching for I'm Coming Back from War. But when we released that, um, it went three years. And then we they, they picked it up for another five years. I think it's in its eighth year on public television. And it showed over 600 times um, during Veterans Day last year. Oh, or, I'm sorry, right. Memorial Day. Memorial Day is our big day. Yeah. So, wow. so it just, you know, it's evergreen. It keeps going. I, I, I think the core audience doesn't get tired of the idea of Hope and Healing. Mm, yeah. Did you, uh, you, you mentioned earlier, you were like, oh, you know, my favorite movies. Did you, did you ever have an affinity for documentaries or was that just kind of where you fell into? You know, if, if surf movies are documentaries. <laughs> what is that? If surf movies are documented, yeah. <laughs> I love stories. I love, of course, Endless Summer. Bruce Brown was just a, an amazing person. But here's it's interesting because I don't like watching, gosh, documentaries unless it has to do with surfing because I get weird. I'm like, oh, I should do that. I should do that. Or it's like, I, I, I want to live, I kind of live in my own world about how I make my films. And, and I'm not really... Uh, I'm not really that influenced. If I was influenced by documentaries, I would listen to like what, when I released Searching for Home, Coming Back from War, um, you know, it took three times to get a distributor for it. And a lot of the distributors were like, well, it has too many stories in it and people just want to hear one story. And I'm like, well, that's my whole thesis. Yeah. That's the whole film. You're missing it by a mile. 
So if I, I don't want to be too influenced by other documentaries, you know, and I do have my top five favorite films that are non-documentaries and it usually surprises people what they are. Yeah. yeah well, let's hear it. What are your top five? Oh, I, first of all, I'm surprised that you can, I'm a movie buff and I, limiting it to five. Super oh, cool. no, no, no. I mean, that's like, that's ridiculous. I do have a list that goes into 20, but I'm trying <laughs> to like always move certain films into my top five. And Right. Right. So what are know. they? What do you got? Oh my gosh. I, Annie Hall. Okay. You know, Stardust Memories. Big Woody Allen fan. There's an homage to Woody Allen and Unmasking Hope. He shoots in, uh, he's he's shot a couple times in Manhattan and in um, Cafe Society. He loves Central Park. He shoots around the Bow Bridge, if you're uh, familiar with uh, the Central Park. So we shot at the Bow Bridge mm. and that was really fun. And there's an interesting rule in New York is, uh, is you don't require a permit if you don't put anything down permanently. Huh. So we, we got we went totally mobile and we shot all over New York and it was great. But um, anyways, those two Woody Allen movies, and, and I gotta say, this is re- people are like, this is where they, it either makes or breaks me with my relationship with my film buff friends. <laughs> Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Oh, now, that would be so several, fantastic. I've actually tried to behind I, that. I've tried to contact Mark Holton a couple times to get him to come on here because I just love Francis. You know, oh. he's just so funny. He's so oh, funny. Good. I'm, 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 okay, we're connecting yeah. here. And fu- funny thing, actually, I had Stephen Kyoto on uh, not too long ago who did the uh, the animation for Large Marge. Oh, and, really? Uh, yeah, he also did Killer Clowns from Outer Space, and he worked on Team America World Police. And, and he was a really fascinating guy if you ever get a chance to talk to him. He... His stories about how they made Large Marge, you know, the, the part where she turns into yeah. a ghost, was really fun to hear. That's one of my favorites too. I love that movie. That movie's well. Great. There's you know there's Henry Selleck too and that whole crowd. And one of the things I love about that film, it's so California to the arts. It's so Cal Arts based. Tim Burton, the director, went to Cal Arts. That was his first big film after that. Mm-hmm. Pee Wee, um, um, Paul uh, Rubens, Rubens. Um, yeah. Paul Rubens. Well, went to California and studied the arts. He was our he was actually our um, director, our, our alumni president for quite a while, and he would throw these crazy parties. And it was so funny because my friends are like, "Oh, I went to USC. We're going to an alumni party, and our president is now Am you know owns Amgen." And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm going to my uh, alumni party, and I'm going with Pee Wee Herman." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, boom, gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. I feel that way too. Sometimes I feel as an attorney, I'm a little out of place because I talk to some of the other attorneys and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I got a bonus. I went to, you know, I went to Greece or whatever. And they'd be like, what did you do? And I was like, I bought a Metallica pinball machine. Um, I, I'm totally stoked with it. You know, I got this yeah. video game thing in my, in my house and it's great. So, so yeah, that Pee Wee's a good one. <laughs> yeah. And, um, there's, there's an amazing film called Cutter's Way and I don't know what it is about that film. And it, it's, um, Ivan Passer is the name of the director. Jeff Bridges, John Hurd. Um, hmm. it, it's about it's a murder mystery that's set in Santa Barbara during a, a period called Fiesta, where the whole town parties. I grew up in Santa Barbara. Hmm. The whole town just, I mean, literally, it's like the banks closed down. People are walking downtown with a with a six pack, a Takati, and a <laughs> and a tequila here and it's just yeah. like but it's about fiesta time and a murder mystery that takes place and um it's just an absolutely amazing film one of the best opening sequences ever to me and it's just one shot shot with a with a long lens and um gosh That's i awesome. love that film but uh That's then apocalypse now oh yeah and of course movie. you know it's kind of yeah. but but the best thing is <laughs> The best thing is, I, I ride Yater surfboards, mm. and the Yaters f- featured in that. And I met I met Lauren Yater and Rennie Yater, Reynolds Yater, the the guy that started Yater surfboards there mm. in Santa Barbara. I've gotten custom surfboards from both of them, and um, nice. there's a great there's a great scene where um, uh, Colonel Kilgore has his his board uh, the the um, Duvall character. Um, and uh, Martin Sheen and his crew steal the board, and so they're going up river, and they're sending the helicopters off with the with the PA saying, "Will you please give Mac my board?" And it was Sam Bottoms, and his name is um, Lance, 
in the film. Lance, please give back my board. I need the board. We will not hurt you. You know how hard it is to find a good board. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. anyway, but then one of my, I think it's at the very top of all films is um, Big Wednesday. And it's an homage to friendship, surfing. It rolls Vietnam in there in a very delicate and beautiful way. And, uh, you know, it's uh, Jan Michael Vincent, William Cat, Gary Busey, directed by one of my favorite directors who I got to meet once is John Milius. Hmm. And uh, it's just an absolute beautiful film. I try to watch it once a year. I try to watch it with my boys. It's a very... Hmm. I want to say it, it's a very man-oriented journey because it, it, it culminates in Big Wednesday, the biggest day where you go out and test yourself. Because <laughs> when you surf, you're by yourself in the ultimate thing, and it's a, it's a big test of, of that. But it's also about friendship, three friends growing up around surf. And um, I remember I went to the, gosh, what was it, the 30th or 25th anniversary screening, and my friends and I, we sat right behind John Milius and his assistant, and my friend whispers to me, he goes, this is way better than the DVD box set because we have commentary from John Millius and right in front of us. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's funny. You you bring up watching movies with your boys. I've, I'm proud to say, you know, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. And so they are all well, well versed in in uh in in that cinema and that in those genres. I love uh, Rocky, the Karate Kid, you know, um, and uh, in fact, my son was feeling, my youngest son, he's, he's uh, almost 10. He's feeling sick last night. And so I was like, all right, I'm sick. Is it Karate Kid or is it Princess Bride? You know, and I was like, it's <laughs> up to you, whatever you want to do, you know. And so, um, yeah, you know, it's always fun to share your love of movies with, with your kids. In fact, my, my theater that I built uh, in, my, in my house, it's a, it's a Rocky theater. I have a bunch of memorabilia. Oh, my gosh. And, what do you and, think about the new Creed movies? Liked it. Liked it a lot. Yeah, it was a really good one. I mean, I would say Creed 3 was probably, um, I would say it's probably a step down from 1 and 2, a little bit. Um, and that may just be my bias because uh, Sylvester Sloan and Rocky, the character, isn't in it at all. It stands alone on its own, and I like that. And I think that I've heard they're doing a fourth one, and I'm interested to see what they do. It's interesting because the story, the story arc in Creed, I mean, how do you get bigger than fighting the son of Drago? Yeah. You know? So when you do those two and then you go kind of, you know, th that was the ultimate story. I was telling a friend of mine who's a big movie buff, I told him, I said, I, I wish they would have saved the Drago fight for the third one, you know, done kind of something like that because that would have been a huge story. But it was good. And Jonathan Majors is excellent. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. so good in that movie. He was great in um, the recent Marvel movie. He played the the new character. I can't remember his name. He was in oh yeah, the bad guy. Yeah, yeah, the physicality of of both Michael B. Jordan and and what's his name, Majors, Jonathan Majors. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. But yeah. I got there's there's a great story about with with my two boys. One of my favorite movie movie moments was. Uh, the 50th anniversary of 2001 a space odyssey and oh. uh it was playing at the cinerama dome i literally got tickets three months in advance and i took my two boys who are now 23 and 25 and um and they're my oldest he does jujitsu my middle boy was a football player D1 oh, nice. in, in, in college and um so they're they're manly men <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But, but we, 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 we love going to the movies together. So we go to the um, Cinerama Dome, and uh, I love popcorn. Oh, me too. I, I, the boys get the seat, and I'm in the popcorn line, and my oldest son, Pete, texts me, Dad, you got to get in here. They're doing trivia before the movie. <laughs> this is 2001 The Space Odyssey. He goes, you could be killing it. And I'm like, okay, I got to get my popcorn. You know, I'm addicted. Right. And uh, he's like, okay, great. Then a little and he's texting me. And then so I get back in with my popcorn and everything. And he goes, he goes, um, you know, Christopher Nolan just introduced the film. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. And we're like 12 feet from where the podium was, you know, back in uh, three rows. And I love Christopher Nolan. And yeah. He goes, yeah, he just introduced the film. He said it's a special print that's unprocessed as far as digitally that he pulled from Metro Goldwyn Mayor Vaults or something. 
And I'm like, no, no way. What's Christopher? And the guy turns around in front and goes, yeah, dude, Christopher Nolan was here. <laughs> I'm like, no way, my popcorn. <laughs> but uh, we watched 2001, and it, my boys were blown away. It, it's just Stanley Kubrick. I mean, yeah. it, it didn't age. It was it was absolutely freaking beautiful. And the effects were like, oh, on that yeah. Cinerama Dome screen, it was just freaking amazing. Yeah, see, that's amazing. It's always cool when a movie... When, when a movie you love, you can watch it and it stands the test of time. You know, and I, you know it's interesting going back to my first film, Faces in the Fire, and and uh, speaking of that and making the jump back is, is you know, it, I, I, I watched some of it the other day. It's it, it, If you Google it, Faces in the Fire, uh, UCSB, uh, yeah. UCSB, because uh, it's part of the University of California, Santa Barbara archives now. Oh, nice. Um, but I watched it. And I'm like, you know, it's very dated in the techniques, but the emotion still worked. It still hit me. And I'm like, wow, that's that's pretty weird. 30 years after I made that movie. So revisiting it was really weird. Yeah, I bet. Especially because it's something personal to you, you know? I, I always find it interesting. You know, I did, a, I did some journaling, especially when I was on my mission for my church. I served in Indiana for two years. And, and I made a point of writing down things in, in a journal while I was out there. And it's interesting when you're in a different place and you go back and you look at what you were thinking at a certain time and you go, man, sometimes you're like, man, what was I thinking? And then oh, you know, like, that's quite often to me. Yeah. I, that could be yesterday too. Yeah. Yeah. You look back and you go, man, you know, what was I thinking at this moment or that moment and things that you don't remember happening, happening. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you go back and you're in a different place and you see what happened and you just go, wow. And, you know, uh, and I guess that's part of trauma and part of healing, you know, which is, which is kind of cool. So what, let me ask you real quick. Oh, sorry. You look, you want to say, no, something. I was going to say that's an interesting thing that you brought up is connecting with that person that you were, you know, it's like post, if the trauma was a long time ago, post or pre trauma, Connecting with that person that you were, that's, I don't have any answer to that or anything or any like deep insight, but that's something I've been exploring lately. It's like, gosh, as we move through this time, connecting with that person that we were, you know, going back to Indiana or going back to, you know, a, a memorial writer and connecting with that person we were, you know? Yeah. I try yeah. to explain that. I try to explain that to my oldest son not too long ago, because, you know, you, 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 you'll understand this as a father of three kids, you know, you, you, you're su you're such a different dad when you're if it's your first kid than you are with your second or your third or whatever. Oh yeah. You know, and so like my youngest son, he just and I'll admit it, he gets away with murder. You know what I mean? Like comparatively. And so when my older son Austin hears that, or sees that, he's like, if I would have done that at nine years old, you know, that like, that's his thing. And I try to explain to him, like, yeah, I'm a I'm a different person than I was back then. You you were the prototype, you were the guinea pig. Like I'm sorry, I'll pay for your therapy, dude. You're going to have, you know, like you had a, you had a rough, a rough go. Cause I tried to, when he became a teenager, we got in a big fight and I remember telling him, I felt real bad afterwards. Cause I was, I, you know, I did, I wasn't doing great. I, I could have done it better. Could have dealt with it better. And I sat him down and I just said to him, I go, listen, man, um, you've never been a teenager before and I've never parented a teenager before. So I'm going to try to give you a little bit of grace and I hope you just will give me a little bit of grace because this is new for both of us. You know what I mean? Wow, and, you know that honesty just goes so far, and you and then it actually pays off. They get older, then it'll come back to you. Yeah, I think we have a great relationship. He actually recently just told me some stuff. It was funny because he went on a trip. He's big into choir now. I talk about him all the time. I think he hates that I talk about him so much. But like, he's in he's in choir. He's got a rock band. He's a great musician. I think he's incredibly talented. But he goes off to, you know, he was uh, all state choir. He got accepted to the all state choir. So he went to Fresno. I think it was Fresno or Stockton somewhere, somewhere that wasn't super desirable <laughs> to go and, and do this thing. And he came back and he was telling me, st he was telling me stories of things that happened. And, you know, and I'm like, you do understand I'm your, I'm still your dad, right? Like there are, you don't have to tell me everything. Yeah, right. Like, you know, he's like, oh, why can't I say this? And I'm like, I, I guess you can can i'm just saying i'm kind of you know <laughs> it's like i mean i guess it's good that you trust me enough to tell me these things but i'm like 
Yeah, I mean, it's just, so I do. I have a very good relationship with him. We've bonded a lot. I bonded with all my kids. You know, that's one of the things that's been a blessing that's come through some of the stuff we've gone through in our in our lives is that my uh, my relationship with my kids have grown exponentially over the last four or five years. And, and they're just so great. But yeah, you know, it's interesting because you look back at those times. The thing about, I, I was that was a long aside to what I really wanted to say was that, <laughs> was that I think that it's even the same with kids. If you think about it, I was just saying this to my daughter who just turned 12. I was like, it's so weird being a parent because when you're a parent, it's not like you're parenting one person the whole time. Like you're a baby, then you're a toddler, then you're a little girl, then you're an older girl, and then you're a, now you're a preteen. So you're going to be a teen, then you're going to be a young woman, then you're going to be a married woman. And I was like, and the problem is I see you every single day. So like when I see you every single day, I don't notice the transition. And so one day I just, there's this new person sitting in front of me and I never got to say goodbye to the person you were, you know what I mean? And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, that's that. interesting because I don't think that's, it, it's, it's, I could talk, being a dad is my number one thing above being a yeah. filmmaker. And, um, you know, it just, I, it's, that's something that's not talked about enough and, and I'm experiencing it because, you know, my kids are all away and, and, and being very independent and, um, and they actually, my son's coming back tonight and dad is the surf good and he's going to go paddle out tomorrow. And well, I don't know if I get windy at around 11, make sure you're the, you know, <laughs> anyways. Yeah. but the, the thing that's not talked about is grief. And, and cause you know, it's funny because we have, you know, our, our, TV and for some reason on Amazon it clicks back and it shows old pictures that were like sometimes uploaded, mm -hmm. and I'll see these old pictures of my daughter or even on my scrolling on my in my Google Photos, and I I, I grieve those that little girl that I used to take on dates into the movies and yeah. I saw pictures of us at a dance at the elementary school dance, mm -hmm. and 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 it it breaks my heart a little bit, but then again, I, I, then she'll call me and I'll talk to the woman she is now and all the things she's doing, what she's so excited about. And I'm like, Oh, oh okay. And trying to connect it to, is kind of weird, but then also I have to realize I carry a little bit of grief for missing that little girl and missing my little boys. You know, they, they used to skateboard with me when I, when I, when I would skate and we'd go to, we went to over 20 skate parks together, my my two boys and I. My three-year-old, he was three. Will was three, and he was ripping it at three and four, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's funny. It's funny you bring that up. I just, I, it reminded me of a story, and I actually, my daughter is going to kill me if she ever hears this, but I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway. And she, I'll deal with the consequences. My daughter, my 14-year-old daughter, man, she's a punisher. <laughs> so, but uh, I love her to death, but, you know, before, when they get to that, it's a weird age for kids, you know, six to like 40. But uh, no, they, she, she, when she, um, you know, she's 14 now. And so dealing with a, you know, a dad, you know, she doesn't want me around all the time. You know what I mean? She, she's got her girlfriends and she, you know, talks to them. She doesn't let, you know, my two boys and even my younger daughter, you know, who's 12, they, they tend to open up to me quite a bit. She's a hard nut to crack. I can get it, but it takes, I have to drag it out of her you know and oh yeah and so we had a bit of a little you know a little tiff over something and and um and i wrote her a letter and i and i shared the story with her where i remember there was a time she had to have been maybe four years old three or four years old it was in the middle of law school i was worried you know i was working full time i was in law school i was trying to get everything you know do everything is super busy and i fell asleep on the couch i think while i was studying or whatever and in the morning she wakes up and she comes in and she, you know, cuddles next to me because she's four, you know, and still loves me. And so she comes in and she cuddles me. And I remember I was like, I'm late for a meeting. And I got up and she asked me to stay. And I remember looking at her and being like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Pipes. I can't, I can't stick around. I got to go to this meeting. And I got up and I left. And I told her, I was like, you know, I think about that now when it's like, I understand you don't want me around. You don't want to hug me. You don't want to kiss me. But it's like, I think back at that time and I wish I would have stayed a little longer. You know what I mean? Oh, man. Because... You don't even know how much I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. You know, because yeah. I, I thought my little girl would be around forever. And now she's she's in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And yeah. uh, I, I thought I thought I thought I might have had maybe a couple more weeks or something. Yeah. But it's just not that way. I want one more date. I want to be loved to go to movies and 
you know, and all that. And I just, it, it, and it's, but it's different now. I'm excited. I'm excited now to kind of push forward into the, I, I got to focus on that, push forward into what's next. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go out and see her in May. Oh, and, awesome. um, she wants me to come along, which is really cool because she just wants to see her dad. My mom and I are pretty tight and, and, uh, but it, it was, it, it, it um, I was honored that she just got dad. I just want you because, and her boyfriend Finn and and her community. She knows I really flow with that whole thing, and I'm excited to be part of it. So, and we'll see what the next phase brings. That's awesome. Well, tell me. I get it. I get what you just said so much. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me, tell me. As far as now, do you have a project in mind next? I mean, now you've done Unmasking Hope. It's done very well. You got another idea that's coming up. You know, I have a screenplay and uh, based on based on one of my documentaries, based on Homecoming of Vietnam Vets Journey. It's about a Vietnam vet, but it's also about 1970s surfing culture. It's about the flow of surfing culture. It's about professional surfing. When they first clashed, you know, the soul surfers became, started making money. <laughs> yeah. And it's about Vietnam and it's about, it's about, finding finding your soulmate in 5d not just 3d mm. it's about all this stuff now with that said it's it's called a uh, angel fire mm. with that said do i want to spend another five years of my life of heartbreak trying to just get it off the ground to then have to compromise for the rest of its you know to mm. get it done i don't yeah. know i don't know i don't have another documentary i i don't want to i don't want to structure another documentary the same way I did this. It's very mm-hmm. difficult monetarily. Yeah. And um and I'm gonna be a grandpa, you know, and I'm looking forward to that little that little being coming into my life. And I want to be there and be the first one when he puts or she, he mm-hmm. or she puts their little tiny feet in salt water. That's really mm-hmm. amazingly important to me. Yeah. Because of my connection with the ocean. So um maybe that's maybe that's my next project i don't know it's you know it's okay i'm in transition mm-hmm. and i'm gonna let god kind of deal with that and um and then try just to enjoy the best to enjoy what's going on now you know and then and then be a grandpa and then uh you know be there for my kids and be there for my daughter and do do that stuff so that's that's the answer i'm just kind of uh it's okay not to have an answer i've discovered yeah, no, that that is that, that's absolutely okay. I, I remember hearing George Lucas say after um, after he had done, I think it was he did the first three, you know, the the prequels, and they asked him what he wanted to do next, and he said, "I think I have earned the right to fail at everything I do for the rest of my life." <laughs> so it was like, I'd love to get there, you know, where it's like, eh, it doesn't matter anymore if I'm successful or not. I'm just going to do the stuff I want to do, and, right? And, and so, well, um, I, I, you know, I appreciate your time and I want to ask you a few questions and I think yeah. I probably know the answers to, to a couple of them, but I'm going to ask them anyway. What would you say is your biggest success in life? Oh, <laughs> being clean and sober for 32 years. Yeah. Yeah. And then close second becomes my marriage, which is going on 30. Yeah. You know, and, um, but I think being clean and sober means it's a relationship that I have a spiritual relationship, that an ongoing spiritual relationship. And people are like, oh, you have a lot of willpower. Oh, no, I just showed up. I just bring the willingness yeah. and then God does the rest. And, and, but the willingness is a, is a big job. Yeah. But uh, that's, that's it. That's it. And it's interesting that you bring that up in connection. You, you are 32 years sober, 30 years married in it. And, I'm guessing that if you had not gotten sober, that marriage probably wouldn't happen. I don't think I'd be alive. I don't think I had that many more years. My doctor said I only had a couple of years on my on my uh, liver, but it's not even just that. It's just the way I lived. I, I would not have been alive. But yes, there's a direct connection between me working what I would call my program and my spiritual my spiritual fitness and the longevity of my wedding, uh, marriage. That's awesome. And your kids came from that. So that's great. Yeah. So uh, what would you say was your biggest failure in life and what did you learn from it? Oh, my gosh. Um, man, I, I just draw a blank there. Um, 
You're like, I've been so successful at everything I've done. <laughs> I can't even think. No, of you know, it. here's the funny <laughs> thing is, you know, honestly, honestly, professionally, I, I think the biggest thing is just not when, when, when I was riding the tide as a commercial director and stuff, because I think it's because of fear. I didn't grab the next rings that were going by me. Mm. And I would go into, I would, I would go into big agencies and show them my reel. And they're like, where have you been? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and I didn't follow up on that. I just, I just thought, I just thought that would go on forever and everything. And, and so that part of my career kind of disappeared, you know, and that was in sobriety, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and that professionally, I think was, you know, but um, I got to say, one of my biggest failures was around 20 years sober. I, I was expecting way too much out of life at 20 years. I thought I, I deserved X and this and this, and I kind of went off the rails. I didn't drink again, didn't use, but man, I had some expectations of what life should have brought me. And it kind of brought a lot of uh, pain to my family. And thank God I found my um, sponsor at the time, John B. And he was 80. 80, no, he was 70 something years old. He just passed away last year. He was 86 years old, 56 years of sobriety. Yeah. And he walked me through when the wheels came off at 20 years of sobriety all the way until a year ago. And then he's left and I have a new sponsor. But um, when you say it went off the rails, like, what do you mean? What were you experiencing? What was going on? You know, I just thought I, I was angry. And I, and I can feel that sometimes still. I was angry that I, I, I had expectations. Oh, you were angry about your expectations. Where I was supposed to be at 20 years sober. I didn't have this. I didn't I didn't do this and all this. And, um, you know, and um, I just I just kind of disconnected with everything for a while. And um, there was there is some turmoil involved with my personal decisions during that time. Uh, yeah. You know, what's funny about that? Um, because yeah, expectations, that's a, that's a really interesting thing because I've, I've run into that too. You have all these expectations of where you're going to be. And if you just, you know, what do they call it? Comparison is the thief of joy. You know, like you sit yeah. there and I know that, you know, um, I've seen that in, in people, my members of my family, where they just expect all these things. And, and sometimes it's an expectation that you never were going to live up to, you know, and, um, and yet somehow, some way, like, you know, if you're always looking for the things that you don't, you can always look at something you don't have and wish you had it, you know, but you got, you got three wonderful kids and, you know, you're, you're, that's exactly it. And I got very involved in what I thought the world should offer and not what God's economy is. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it just, again, I didn't have to drink or use, but I had to, I kind of had to start all over. And, you know, some people would call it, let's see, what was that? That was 20 years of sobriety, 12 years ago. So I was about 50 years old, a little bit before 48. I guess mm -hmm. I would call it a midlife crisis or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, you know, but my wife and I made it through. John B. helped me. And, um, you know, and now, now I... I know when that's coming up. It's a tough transition. I got to be honest. You asked me that question. What am I going to do now? Now that I don't have films to do, it's a tough transition. Yeah. Am I going to do another film? That's a hard thing to kind of reconcile with Mike because I've done it since I was eight years old. So, but I'm aware of like where I can go off the rails. I'm aware of what I should do. You know, reach out, reach out to Doug, you know, my, my friend in recovery, reach out to my sponsor, Steve, my current sponsor and, and, and be patient with my wife. Yeah, <laughs> right on. That's toughy. No, uh, so um, uh, now the last question, it, it's, some people have a hard time with it. Um, someday, you know, down the road, we hope 20, 30 years from now, you know, you'll uh, you pass away and there'll be a funeral and there'll be a eulogy. And uh, what would be the one thing that you hope somebody says in your eulogy? You know, that, that, you know, that I helped a lot of people and that I was a good husband and a really good dad. Yeah. You know, and I was there, I was there, you know, for, I mean, cause you know, being a dad, you can be a dad, but you, yeah. there's a lot of dads that aren't there. Yeah. You know, that's one of my main things is like, and, and you mentioned this with your daughters, I believe all the kids have a little lock 
and you have the keys, but those keys change a lot. Yeah. And you have to go back and work to get the new key to each one and take that time to uncover that. So you really are in the inside of their, of their life. And it never stops now. You know, they're 25, 23, and 20, you know, 21, and I still have to figure out what those keys are. Yeah. Been doing great work with my daughter, my middle boy. We're in a position I never thought I would be when he would get older as far as our relationship. And then my older boy right now, you know, getting married and everything. He has so much going on. I got to figure out how I can work myself into there again. And, yeah. and, um, and how, and, you know, it's the cats in the cradle song, you know, gee, yeah. dad, I really would, but I don't have the time, you know, and it's yeah. like, so it's, it's always a thing, but yeah, I, I want to be known for that. Helped a lot of people, a good husband, I hope. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and the dad. You know, what's interesting is with the kids, I think is interesting is, um, uh, I think that I think kids want to have the best relationship they possibly can with you. I think that they really want to, especially in the early years. And, uh, you know, if you let your own, you know, stuff going on or your own trauma, it's very easy, you know, especially when you're going through bad times to, um, uh, you know, to get cynical or, or, or to be bitter. And kind of take that out on them and be like, ah, you know, I'm not really interested right now. And then one day they're going to stop asking. And, oh, yeah. you know, and, and that's the thing is that like, uh, you know, you, you could potentially, it could be the realistically the best relationship you ever have as long as you're there and you're present. And 80% of it is just that being there and being willing to say yes, you know. Oh, I, I so agree. And, you know, just <clears throat> we could probably have a whole show just on, you know, being a parent, but you know, one of my biggest things is like, just, just with my middle boy too, and getting, it, it's just losing my expectations yeah. of what, how it should look. Yeah. And then here's another thing that John always told me is none of my business, what other people think about me, none of my business. Mm -hmm. And that includes your family. So when my boys are miffed and they think dad this, dad that, because, you know, I, I didn't grow up the jock. I, I wasn't certain things. But I would have in my head what they would, none of my business. I got to let that go, you know, and I got to let my expectation. Because I'm your dad, that's an expectation. Mm -hmm. When I let that, because just because I'm your dad, you got to think of me a certain way. When I let that expectation go, that's when my relationship flourished with my little boy. Mm. It's not weird. There's a there's a weird kind of um, yin and yang going on there. Yeah. Isn't it also interesting? We're talking about kids. You know, it's interesting how you can't. I, I tried to explain that to my son too. I was like, I can't parent all of you the same. You know what I mean? I, it was like with you, I got to pound it in your head. Like I got to really make sure you understand it. I was like, you know, your your younger sister. If I look at her wrong, she'll break down and cry. You know what I mean? And I was like, and your older sister, I could hold a gun to her head and she wouldn't do it. You know what I mean? And it's like, so, you know, I can't, I can't discipline you or talk to you the same. I have to find, I have to find what it is for you specifically. And, tr and each one of you is different. And that's one of the most fascinating things about it. And, you know, it's, it's interesting what you said, what you, what you said about your eulogy that tells me that you're doing something right. You know, that the things that you care about are being a, you know helping other people being a good husband being a good dad so all that other stuff you know your transition and all those different things it's all going to work out because you got your priorities straight and that's awesome yeah now all i have to do is lose a considerable amount of weight because uh <laughs> don't no, this goes back to what we're talking about my, <laughs> i talked to my boy the other day and he, he he said it directly he goes dad you know this chance for you right now to get back in health and lose your weight and stuff and get out there this summer meaning surfing I'm a little bit too big right now for me to be comfortable. I, I paddleboard and do all this other stuff, but paddling and like being out in actual surf, he goes, this is the last window you have and I want to surf with you again. Yeah. But I'm well, like, that's, wow. Okay. That's the, that's that's the motivation. Motivation. Here's my goal for this like next six months is like, okay, yeah. get, get that get, weight off. Get, get ready. Confidence. Yeah. Lots of, I'll tell you lots of chicken and rice, man. Ugh. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm. A, I was. A, I was technically supposed to be in the middle of a cut right now, and it is not going well. <laughs> so what, so, yeah, my son does jujitsu. 
my oldest. Oh, he loves yeah, so, it. And they both they both of them love UFC. Oh yeah. 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 So, so what kind of wrestling do you do? Well, it's like WWE style wrestling, you know. I do that type of stuff, which is interesting because the WWE was just bought by Endeavor, it just, which owns the UFC. So yeah, kind of coming together. No, I I do that, and uh, and you know, I I actually just a little aside about me about uh, 2018. You know, when I was going through school and all these things, I had some turmoil in my own personal life. I was gained a lot of weight, and I'm I'm sit. You can't tell on the video, but I'm six foot seven, and so um, I. Uh, I gained, I probably weighed 350 pounds at my heaviest, 354 or something like that. And I got in a car accident and I got a brain injury. Uh, oh, man. A, 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 con- a concussion. It wasn't like I had a bleed, but but a concussion. And I'd had a, I'd had a couple in the past, that r- but rung my bell. So it took a little bit of time. And, uh, and then I went in and I got, I, you know, I got weighed and I had a scare about diabetes because there's diabetes runs in my family. And so... That was like the wake up call for me. I think I was 38 years old. I was like, I gotta, I gotta dial this in. And I'll tell you what, like the moment I did, there was a lot going on at that time. And I finally said, I need to focus on my physical health. It was so interesting how much the, there was a, a direct relation with my physical health and my mental health. Oh, when, yeah. I, mm-hmm. when I started, when I started losing weight, I went from like 350 to like 288, but I oh, wasn't really yeah. going to the gym. And then, uh, and then, and then I, I got, a guy got me to go to the, start going to the gym and I started lifting weights and I got down to about 220 and then I built back up and now I'm about, I'm about 280, but it's different. It looks different. It's not the same. I'm, I'm more muscular than I was. It's a little padding left, but, but, uh, but that whole, that whole process, it was amazing to me how, how much just getting into the gym, eating right, exercising, even just a little bit every here and there will um will boost your mental health so you know if you can do that that'd be great get back out on that surfboard well you know i got i got my peloton i have my dog i got the beach i got my steps and then i got my paddle boarding for upper potty and so i'm, I'm going it's just you know here's the thing and it, for me i don't want to do a diet i want to change how i live no that's exactly right you yeah the no, diet still takes work. longer yeah I, you know, but that's the thing that people I don't realize. I talk, I talk to a lot of people. They, they, I'm pretty big on like Facebook and Instagram and I post photos and stuff. And so people contact me and I tell them, I go, yeah, you know, the Atkins thing or whatever the pro, what do, what do they call it? Keto. It's not sustainable. You know, what you just have to do is you have to change your lifestyle. You can still eat, you know, bad once in a while. It's just a matter of understanding. Here's my, you know, here's what I can eat, you know, and here's how much of it I can eat. And if I go over one day, I got to go a little bit less the other day or, or work it off in the gym. And, you know, if you if you can change your life that way, it's 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 not a diet. It's just a lifestyle. Yeah. So, yeah, I can, yeah I'm, 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 this summer is my goal is I'm going to paddle out at least a couple times, no matter what my shape, just so I can get that feeling. And then that's going to really help me. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to be paddling a lot. Stand you get up. The, get, when you get those endorphins going and you feel so good, it's. It's funny because now I know, like we just had Easter, right? And I'm a big Reese's egg guy and all that. And so I just, <laughs> I went overboard, but I knew I was like, I'm going to feel this for a couple of days, but I don't care. You know what I mean? And then, and then the next couple of days is like, that's why you don't do that, Josh. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? Oh so my gosh. Right there. But well, anyway, well, Hey, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. It, it's, this is what's so cool. I don't know if I would have ever met you any other way. Oh yeah, so, this has been awesome. What a great combo. It's uh you know, I love exercising my brain. It's a great way to get yeah. going here. Yeah. Ready to exactly. launch into the weekend. My boys come in tonight, it's gonna be all good. Yeah, awesome. Well, hey, you know what? I and I also have to say, I am also a big popcorn guy. I go to the theater because of the popcorn. Well, I know. Yeah, that stuff is that that butter, it may not be real butter, I don't care. It tastes amazing. So, you know, that's the one thing that's the one concession I've done now is like, I no longer get the butter and I don't put any extra salt on it and I've gotten used to it and I look forward to it still. <laughs> that's good. That's good. You're giving me hope then. So yeah. uh, anyway, well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah. Thanks. Um, th- this is the place where I tell everybody to subscribe, watch Unmasking Hope. It's, it's, an, it's a fantastic documentary. It's streaming on the PBS website. It'll be all over 
everywhere 600 times this weekend um you know and uh and, and go find uh, where can we find your other work well real quickly on, on unmasking up i just want to mention you know on your smart tv download the pbs app it costs nothing you're not going to like next month when it expires you're not going to also but 7.99 what, what am i paying for it, it, they don't do that and then download the pbs app search on masking hope and then uh, take a watch there uh, it's also on air your local pbs station and then you can uh, go to also unmasking hope the movie.com and that has all the information and then the information about me is ecproductions.com ec eric christensen ecproductions.com and uh also unmasking hope on instagram and facebook and you can follow us we're we're in all sorts of film festivals now and we're going to have some screenings around the united states so follow us and see what's going on awesome well, well i'll definitely follow you and i appreciate you coming on and if you do have another project let me know and i'm going to have you back i want to hear about it okay well i'll come back and let's talk about being dads <laughs> yeah exactly we can spend the whole time doing dads that's awesome okay um, awesome. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you, Josh. Listening. All right. Okay. Bye -bye.